1 Timothy chapter 4. I want to say thank you to all of you for your prayers and your concerns for our family as we welcome to the world um, uh, Carly, our youngest now. Um, especially thank you to those who have helped to bring bringing food and just being a blessing to us. We really appreciate that very much. Verse 1 of 1 Timothy chapter 4. Now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. Father, as we come before you to open your word, to understand your word, and to apply it, May your Spirit give us the grace. May your Spirit enable us. Uh, may you do what is in our sight um, miraculous and that you take the very words of yourself, your own words, through a human vessel and make them implanted deep in our lives and in our hearts and our minds. Lord, please remove that which is from me and I pray that that which is from you would remain in hearts today. And may we go from this place not just hearing good words from you, God, but may we go obeying your good words. We thank you, Jesus, and we pray that the Spirit of grace would enable us to understand and obey. In Jesus' name, amen. As certain as we believe the gospel of Jesus Christ and the truth of grace and the freedom that God gives us in his sovereign grace to pursue holy living in Christ, there are some who are the enemies of Christ. It's not a popular thing to say today, uh, but there are many people who are the enemies of Christ, the enemies of His church, the enemies of the gospel, the enemies of grace. And this is nothing new. The enemies of the divine gospel truth have consciences that have been cauterized, it says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, seared past feeling. They have been cauterized. They feel no remorse for what they do, and they think nothing of causing others to disbelieve and question what God has revealed in His Holy Word. That's what we learn in 1 Timothy 4.1, which we looked at two weeks ago. These deviants are obviously not going to announce, hey, I'm here to turn you away from the gospel. I don't want you believing in God. No, the Bible says that they are with seducing spirits. Spirits underneath, demonic powers underneath, seducing people to give away from the revealed truth of God's Word. The Bible says in chapter 4, verse 1, they are, or chapter verse 2, they are hypocritical liars who with smiles and good speeches profess allegiance to the gospel of Jesus Christ, they speak passionately and persuasively into the ears of undiscerning, inexperienced minds in the truth. And they convince many through their lies that they have the secret to holiness or that they have the path to a full life. Their words drip like honey on expectant tongues as they promise life, happiness, meaning, fulfillment. But they bind souls in lies of work and work and work. There is always one more rule to obey. Always one more work to do. One more ritual to keep. And in keeping the codes and ordinances, devaluing, devaluing true love and holiness with empty ritual. And so go ahead and sin as you please with your drunkenness and revelry and satisfy your soul. Then confess and do penance and make up for it in some fashion for atonement. Pursue your pleasure. Then do a temple work and offset the failure. Make the external priority and bury the false motives under the layers of work and ritual. And when you're released from your principles, when you're not at the temple, the synagogue, the church... 
live life to its fleshy fullness. These teachers that teach this and they, they evidence this, they lead people down a dangerous spiral, one where legalistic activity and libertine thinking collide. Where one is free to live immorally, selfishly, and lustfully, while then countering the guilt with ritual, religious expression, and tears of remorse. And the most dangerous part of such a life and this teaching, this demonic doctrine, is that those who bend their ears to be tickled by this teaching with this system of rule and riot are so busy satisfying their flesh and then making up for it with their ritual that they don't see that Jesus Christ frees us from that life. They have no room for Him. But mere platitudes to put on signs, to, to speak the name as some kind of talisman, but no real focus on the finished work of Jesus Christ on our behalf, because they're just too busy. Just too busy. Too busy living life to its fullest, and then making up for it with religious expressions. Why it's hypocritical lies. 1 Timothy 4. Hypocritical lies. That is why these speaking lies and hypocrisy whose consciences are seared with a hot iron are so dreadful because they cause those who have heard the good word of God, who have listened to the preaching of the gospel of grace, who have been experienced to some aspect of God's common grace in their life and even the revelatory grace of God's word, it causes them to say, no, you know, I'm turning from this, I am departing, I am apostatizing. I wouldn't say those words, but that's what goes on. And so in chapter 4 of 1 Timothy, Paul is warning Timothy that it's going to happen. There are those who are going to depart from the faith. That word is apostasy there. Now they were never those really chosen by God. For as John says, if they had been of us, they no doubt would have continued with us. They went out from us because they were not of us. It's like the people in Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, who had experienced so much blessing. They had heard the word of God. They had heard of Jesus Christ. They had heard everything there was to hear. But then when faced with the, the dangers that that presents, the sacrifices that that means, when faced with the reality that, that they're not going to be tolerated, they turned back in Hebrews to the former Jewish way of thinking, to the former sacrifices, to doing it over and over again. And it says that in such a situation, for those that have heard the good word of God, who have been partnered with the Holy Spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit has been in convicting them and leading them, and they have, they have heard the prophecies, they've seen what God has done. If they then depart, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh over and over again. They make the sacrifice of Christ of nothing because they knew They'd heard, they'd been exposed to the gospel of grace, and yet when, as the parable, using the same word, the parable arises, Jesus speaks of the seed that falls upon the stony ground, and it springs up. But when the temptations come, when the trials come, it withers and departs, because it had no root after all dangerous place to be. This teaches me something very sobering. It is possible to have individuals sitting under the preaching of God's Word day in, day out, Sunday after Sunday, that make professions of faith in Christ over and over and over again, and yet to still have them hear the words at the day of judgment, depart from me, I never knew you you that workers of iniquity. It's a reality. Paul is telling Timothy, some will depart. But it's also an encouragement. Not all will depart. God has a remnant. He always has a remnant according to faith. He always has believing people. But these teachers that come in 
speaking lies and hypocrisy with their own consciences seared with a hot iron. They are seeking to find those inexperienced, weakened souls and to lead them down to the path of hell. And so it is important that we understand, brothers and sisters, we understand this. I'm speaking to the truly believers this morning at this point. We understand that the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. We must protect the church of God from these hypocritical liars. It begins in the pulpits. But the responsibility goes beyond the pulpit to the chairs. We are the pillar and ground of truth. We are what supports and upholds the truth. And if we compromise the truth of God's word, we are aiding and abetting these hypocritical liars who come in and lead people to depart from the living God. This is not a time when we need to be so concerned about individuals not liking the words we speak, being afraid of being considered by the culture and the world around us as, as intolerant or unloving or uncaring because we say what God says. We say there is one God and only one God and Him we worship alone. We cannot be afraid what the world is going to think about that because we are the pillar and ground of the truth. And Paul is seeking in this text to encourage Timothy in this, to encourage him. It's going to happen. Don't lose heart, Timothy. It's going to happen. But also there is a warning here to those who would attend the worship of God with God's people day in and day out and yet still reject the gospel of grace. There is a warning. There could be a day when you fall away never to repent. Be careful. Be warned of that. This morning, I want to continue looking at verses 3 through 6. We looked at that two weeks ago, this reality of the apostasy. I don't want to rehash that. Um, any more than I already have this morning. Uh, but I want to look at the content of the apostasy, or really the, the root of the apostasy, the root that these hypocritical liars were doing, what they were doing to lead people away, what they were saying, what was going on here, first at Ephesus, and then how it applies to us today and what we must be warned against today. Um, it's called demonic doctrine. Now that's a very harsh term, isn't it? It's not a very tolerable thing to say today, to say that is demonic doctrine. Doctrine of devils. And yet that is exactly the way the Apostle describes it. And then in verse, verse 3, he gives some more evidence as to what makes this demonic doctrine. What was the specific problem here in Ephesus? But before we look at what the specific problem here in Ephesus is, I want to go backwards and see what the first demonic doctrine we have taught in the Bible is. Because in Genesis chapter, uh, chapters 2 and 3, uh, we have an account of the first doctrine taught by the devil himself. I contend that actually we find the same demonic doctrine in Genesis that we find here in Ephesus, as Paul's warning in Timothy. How is this, how, how is it these satanically influenced, seducing liars spin their webs? How could one who sits under the exposition of the word of God be led in such wrong thinking to depart from faith? We might as well say, how could one who has been in the garden of God and has seen the presence of God and experienced the greatness of God be led away by a demonic doctrine. Brothers and sisters, we must not become proud and arrogant to think that somehow we have no fear. When Adam and Eve, in the very presence of God, fell so easily away from truth. See, Satan came to Eve and deceptively began to question the authority of God's revelation. He said, he began this, Yea, hath God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? He is causing her to doubt the accuracy and authority of what God has said by twisting just a little what God said. Because God had said in the garden, He had said, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. That tree, no. Satan comes and he says, did God say you can't eat of every tree? He just reversed it. And he didn't even contradict what God had said at this point. Because God had said they couldn't eat of that tree. But what he's doing is he's devaluing the goodness of God and emphasizing the restriction. 
and Eve, causing Eve to think, wait, what did God say? Wait, what did he mean? Is God good? Causing her to doubt the very revelation of God, but he doesn't stop there as you see the next step in causing Eve to apostatize, to depart. When she responds with what God had said, saying that it's a very bold thing, he sets himself up as her teacher. He informs her very plainly that indeed, God has been lying to them. You see, God's the liar, that's what he's saying, Satan is saying, but I have the answer. Listen to me. I'll tell you what you need to know. Here's the secret. Here's what God's holding back from you. Here's, the, here's the, what you missed. You see, everyone else has been understanding it this way, but I alone have the answer. I know the real meaning behind it. I know the true truth. And what does he say it is? He says, this is what it is. See, God just knows that in the day you eat of that fruit, you will not die, but you'll be as gods, knowing good and evil. That brings us to the, after he set himself up as the teacher, that brings us to the third step and final step of apostasy, absolutely contradicting what God has said. What Satan says in that last little bit is an absolute lie. Because God had said, in the day you eat, you will die. Satan said, no, no, what, what did God say really? He's, what, what, are you sure? I mean, you can't eat of every tree? What, that doesn't sound right. But I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what the truth is. I'll help you understand. God's, God's not being very good. You won't die. Liar. Liar. And so she departs. She gives heed to this demonic doctrine. And her husband, along with her, departs, giving heed to this demonic doctrine. But things have not changed that much over time. In fact, here in Ephesus, we see the demonic doctrine is, is much the same in principle. I was going through the Word of God, going through Timothy and studying for this, and I, I um, began to notice that it's not very much in this epistle that Paul outlines what the false teaching in Ephesus was. He gives a lot of descriptions, but he doesn't say, they're teaching this, which is wrong. Almost as if he, Timothy should know what it is. Paul's already told him, um, and he's just warning him about it. But I did go back and say, what are the times when Paul does tell Timothy, this is what they're doing? And can we piece those together and see if they get a bigger picture of what was the demonic doctrine about in Ephesus. And so, if you go back to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 4, you find the first instance where this is addressed. <coughs> in verse, chapter 1, verse 4, he tells Timothy, don't give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith. So the first thing he warns about, in the problem in Ephesus, is there were these teachers, these people who were going around teaching myths and these endless genealogies. We've preached on this before. We looked at this already, what these means, and so I'm not going to rehash that. And yet, notice what the result of these teaching of the fables and endless genealogies is. What does it say in the text? Which minister questions. Now, we're not talking when it brings up good questions. Another way to translate that, which produces doubtings. Produces doubts. Step one. Cause them to doubt what God has said. Minister questions. Hmm, what? Wait. That, th we, this fable, this teaching he's saying, it says this over here, but that doesn't seem to go with what we know the Old Testament said about this. Which is it? Ministering questions, producing doubts. But notice number two, um, verse six. What happens? There are some that don't have a good conscience. We know they don't have a good conscience because it's been cauterized, been seared, um, from which some having swerved have turned aside unto vain jangling, or just another way of saying foolish talking. talking. And notice verse seven. Desiring to be teachers of the law, 
but understanding neither what they say nor if they affirm. So what's the next thing they do? They, they bring in these fables and these, these genealogies and these vain talking and this story and this story and this experience and this experience and it confuses the people. People stop, stop focusing on Jesus Christ. That's not what they're thinking about. That's not what the sermons are about. That's not what anything is about. It's not about Jesus Christ and His grace. It's now about this long list of pedigree and this over here and people start to struggle and they become doubting what's going on with this. And then they step in and say, but let us tell you what the law really means. Let us tell you what God really means when he says this. They desire to be teachers. Of course, we've read this before. Paul does a little bit of a um, slap in the face and says, but they're absolute idiots. They don't even know what they're talking about. Yet they desire to be teachers. They set themselves up as the authority. Doesn't this make sense, though, if you want to deceive a people? Demean God's authority, set your authority up. Because there's a void. Fill that void with your authority. That's what they do. Now, he doesn't say much about these false teachers again. He mentions Alexander and Hymenaeus, but he doesn't describe much about them except that they made shipwreck of the faith. Until we get to the text at hand today in chapter 4, verse 1. And here he says another aspect of what they do. Verse 3. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats. So here's step three. Undermine God's authority. Set yourself up as the authority. And then contradict what God has said. Blatantly contradict it. Doesn't it sound very similar to what Satan did in the garden? Maybe that's why Paul calls this, what they're, what's happening at Ephesus, demonic doctrine. It comes straight from Satan. And the principle, whether it's something else, maybe in, in every culture, in every place, in every time, it's not forbidding to marriage or abstaining from meats. But here in Ephesus, that's what it was. Whatever the issue might be, the whole point is, what God has said is good, they say is bad. Just like in the garden, God said this is good, Satan said, oh, he's bad. God says you will die, Satan says you won't die. Here, God says marriage and meat is good, they say marriage and meat is bad. But they didn't come out right and say that right away. First, they ministered questions. Then they began to desire to be teachers. And once they have worked themselves into the good graces of the people who are professing to know God, then they spring on them the the final stage, the final step. They bring it home with God's not good. God's not good. So the underlying nature of the demonic doctrines was not a preference here, whether to stay single or get married, eat a certain diet or not, but these liars, after having sufficiently deceived the people into giving heed to them, they go on the offensive and attack the goodness of God. They attack His grace. They attack His gifts. Now, I want to do something because we need to understand this. The point of this text is not marriage and meat. It's not the point of the text. Um, yet Paul does go down this little rabbit trail concerning marriage and meat for a, few, for a, for a sentence. Then he gets back to it in verse 6. This is an example. This was the particular illustration of what was going on in Ephesus. And so I want to take a moment and kind of chase the rabbit down with Paul and then come back to it. So we're going to do that this morning. First, uh, let's notice uh, and ask, ask, ask the question, why, why marriage? Why were they forbidding marriage? And why were they forbidding or commanding to abstain from certain meats? Why, why, what, why would anyone even believe them? And what were they doing with that? What was the whole point of that? Why is that the way they're attacking? God created this world for His children to enjoy. He did. Um, because we live in a sin-cursed world, um, we recognize that much of what is made to enjoy out there has been perverted and twisted and used not to glorify God. And so we could have the tendency as, as, as saints of God, as, as those of God's chosen ones, his elect, we could have the tendency to become like the monks of the Middle Ages. Oh, there's so much evil in this world, we'll just take everything and do nothing. But that would be missing God's intention in this world. He created Adam and Eve in the garden to enjoy the garden. Why? 
so that they would delight in Him as the one who has given them this goodness. So they would glorify Him as the giver of all good things. Because as the Scripture tells us, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Comes down from the Father of lights. God is good. He gives us good things to enjoy. The world twists and takes those good things and makes them evil and uses them for evil purposes and even does it in such a way that is not glorifying to God but simply gratifying of the flesh. But that does not take away from the fact that God created us to enjoy His world. One day, beloved, we will enjoy His world as He recreates it, just as He intended. Until then, we must live with discernment in a world that is sin-affected. Now, I know this because in the text it says, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from each, and notice the rest of this verse, what he says here, this is argument number one, um, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving. But who? Who did God create these things to be received with thanksgiving? Look at the text of Scripture. Who did God create this world for? Of them which believe and know the truth. Did you understand this? That um, this world, the blessings of this world, the goodness of this world, was made for us? Why? Because unbelievers don't truly know how to receive it with thanksgiving. But those who are believers, those who have been justified by God's glorious grace, we have been given the Spirit of God which enables us to know how to receive the good things of God with thanksgiving. And that's what He created it for. You might put it this way. God created the world to be enjoyed by His children. And therefore, those who are not His children, though they may enjoy the blessings of God for a season, are really thieves. Stealing the good gifts that God has given His children. Now God in His long-sufferingness, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, He is holding back His judgment against these thieves. But God gave this world to be enjoyed by you and I. That's argument number one He makes. Argument number two is found in verse 4. For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. Argument number two is then to deny someone from the good gifts of God under the pretense of piety and righteousness, which is what these false teachers were doing, is to attack the very goodness of God. When these false teachers come in and take what God has said is good and say it is bad, they are keeping back the glory that is due unto God for His good gifts. They are stopping people from glorifying Him. Even under the pretense of conservatism and piety and holiness. They're forbidding glory for God. They are causing people whom God created to give thanks to, to focus on the gift rather than the good giver. Argument number three is found in verse five. The reason we know these teachers are wrong is through the study of the Word of God and communion with God in prayer, we understand that God has set apart or sanctified these things as good. You see, in this text, it's not saying in verse 5 that marriage and meat is good only if we say a quick prayer before we do it. You know, oh man, you didn't have a prayer at your wedding. It's not sanctified. It's not set apart. It's not God's wedding anymore. No, no. Oh, yeah. You, you, this happens to you, right? You didn't say a prayer before you ate. It's not sanctified. It's probably going to poison you and kill you. No, that's, that's superstitious and, and, and not the point here. Oh, there is a precedent, I believe, for giving God thanks in everything. And yes, we ought to pray in marriage. And we ought to pray and thank God for the food, but that's not the point of what he is saying here. That's not saying that somehow when we pray before we engage in these marriage or meat, somehow there is a, uh, it becomes holy, whereas before it wasn't holy. Somehow when we pray before we eat the pepperoni pizza, it becomes holy and good for us, which is not true. The contents don't change in the pizza. The point is this. It is already sanctified. 
God sanctified it or set it apart when He made it. When He created marriage, when He created food, food He said it's good. It doesn't have to be remade good. It is good. And as we know the Word of God, and we read it in the Word of God, that God said to Peter, what I have called clean, don't call unclean, and how God told Adam and Eve, it is good. When we read that, we say, it is set apart. It is good. And I can thank God for that goodness. And when I pray in my intercessions, I thank God. And so through the Word of God in prayer, I recognize that these things are good. And so his argument is this. First, God created it to be enjoyed by His believers, marriage and meat. Second, to reject marriage and meat is to reject thanksgiving to God. And third, if you had been in the Word of God in prayer, you would not have been so easily led astray by these false teachers in believing that marriage and meat was bad. That's what he's saying here. So that's the rabbit trail he goes down. Another way to say this, maybe an amplified paraphrase that I wrote was this. Think about it, church. Multiple prophecies have noted that in the latter times some will depart from the faith. They will give heed to hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared. These liars have been seduced by spirits and teach demonic doctrines. Even here in Ephesus, they have been teaching you that celibacy for marriage is holy and good, even forbidding by, forbidden by God, and, and that only eating a certain diet will make you good and righteous. But think about it. One, God gave both marriage and meat in the very beginning so that you who are truly believers and know the truth, would gratefully glorify God with both marriage and meat. And think about it. We know that since God is the giver of all good things, He gave every creature and creaturely comfort to be gladly received, not rejected, so that His children would embrace God's goodness and with gratitude. You know this, brothers and sisters, because the good gifts from God have been set apart and revealed to be good and holy in the Word of God and is recognized as such by spirit and dwelt children when they lift their hearts toward heaven in prayer. The implication is this, brothers and sisters. If the church were to be regularly, both personally and corporately, in the Word of God and seeking wisdom and communion with God in prayer, these teachers would not be so easily able to deceive you with their false piety and legalistic demonic doctrines. Because it is through the Word of God in prayer that we understand truth. Knowledge of the truth. And a commitment to follow divine truth is the greatest antidote to heresy and apostasy. But let's go a little further as we go back to the main point. Not just about marriage and meat. The root of apostasy. But why marriage and meat? Why, why is that the application of this root of apostasy that these teachers are leading in. From the argument of the apostle, we, I'm going to get to that in a moment, but from the argument of the apostle, we understand that the root of apostasy, whether it is error in marriage or meets, legalistic or libertine thing living, or any such deviation from the truth of God, the root of apostasy, apostasy lies in hearts filled with unthankfulness. Was this not why the nation of Israel could not enter into the rest of God? Their unbelief led them to complain and murmur against the good gifts of God. Is this not what led Adam and Eve away from a life with God in innocence? Their dissatisfaction with God's goodness, deceived through Satan, created an ungrateful heart to God, and so they took matters into their own hands. Was this not the sin that the religious leaders were guilty of when the Scripture says that they delivered Jesus over because of envy? Discontentment over Him as the Messiah. And this is, is this not the root of the spiral of depravity we see in nations and communities as revealed in Romans 1? Where it says that when people knew God, they did not glorify Him as God. Neither were thankful. But, which means as a result of neither being thankful, the opposite of that, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools 
and change the glory of the incorruptible God into an image like the corruptible man to four-footed beasts and living things. And what is the result of this? When men are unthankful with the good gifts of God and complain and murmur and whine and cannot give God thanks, what happens as a result? Therefore, it says in Romans 1, God gave them up to a reprobate mind to do those things which are unseemly. You don't want the good gifts I give you. Go ahead and see where that gets you. And then if you read the rest of Romans 1, which we have, it's not a very pretty place. The reality is, ingratitude is the heart or the root of apostasy. Why should we recognize the good gifts of God with thanksgiving? Because He has set them apart through the Word and they are realized in communion and prayer because the gifts of God are intended to draw us into a humble stance of honoring, glorifying, and thanking God. But these hypocritical liars attack the goodness of God so as to make people ungrateful. And, un and catch this, this is important. Ungrateful people look all kinds of places for satisfaction and turn to a number of idols in order to find that hope. Unthankfulness, ingratitude. Going back again, I'm going to back up for just a moment. How does that apply to marriage and meat? The ingratitude. Obviously, we see in the text, right, twice in this text, he talks about they were intended to be received with thanksgiving. Just consider this for a moment. Um, Satan is, is kind of obvious sometimes, and here I think it's obvious. The two first gifts that God gave mankind was marriage and meat. The very first gift he gave Adam was a companion. And what did he tell the two of them together? Of all the trees, freely eat. He gave them marriage and he gave them meat. He gave them companions and he gave them enjoyable food. And so what, is, what does Satan do who hates everything good of God? Takes the two good first gifts of God and turns them. Marriage is bad. Meat is bad. Now, I say, well, today people aren't, you know, we don't do that today. Oh, man, yes, it's happening today. Maybe not in, in, in the same way in Ephesus, but let me ask you, what do you think is under attack so much in our society today? The very first gift God gave. Satan hasn't given up, and he will not give up. He keeps fighting. Of course, we know the end, right? <laughs> we know how it turns out. Marriage is always under attack and always will be under attack. Satan loves to destroy this good gift of God because if he can destroy marriage, the concept of it or the individual actual practice of it, if he can destroy that, he creates unthankful hearts. Meat. On both sides of the issue. Excess. Glutton gluttonous diets. On the other side of the issue... Restrictions in order to make one feel more holy or pious. When Paul himself said, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. You get the focus on the gift of God, and they'll stop thanking God. Same thing happens today. What is the cure for apostasy, though? How, how, how can we stop this? How do we stem this tide? This is verse 6. And, by the way, the rest of chapter 4, which we'll get into in the weeks ahead. But to begin with verse 6. Because he says in verse 6, he's talking to Timothy now. This is singular. The word, word you there. If you put the brethren in remembrance. That's singular. If you, Timothy. If you put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ. And that, that's words, beautiful words to the ears of a minister of Jesus Christ. A pastor. Okay. Hey. That's something I can do. He says, this is how to be a good pastor. Want to be a good servant, good minister of Jesus Christ? This is what you do. Kind of humbling and convicting to me at the same time, as well as encouraging. But here's why it's, it's humbling. Um, he doesn't say, um, write a book. You know, or write, write a series of books about this apostasy. 
He doesn't say, uh, go march down to Washington and, and change the views of marriage dramatically and drastically through the political process. How, how, he doesn't say, get results. Never let anyone in the assembly, Timothy, ever depart. Plead with them, hold them back. Physically, hold them in if you need to do it. He simply says, you want to be a good minister, Timothy, with this apostasy just around and everything going on? Just tell them. And then after you've told them, tell them again. And after you've told them again, tell them again. Remind them. These things. Keep telling them these things. What things is he talking about? Surely the gospel, but I think more specifically the things of chapter 4. That God is good. Tell them that God is good. Tell them that these, those that are saying God is not good are lying. Tell them that ingratitude will ruin their soul. Discontentment will ruin their hearts. Tell them that when they're not satisfied with the family God has given them, they're on the road to apostasy. Tell them when they're not satisfied with the children God has given them, or the parents God has given them, they're on the road to apostasy. Tell them that they're not satisfied with the assembly God has placed them in, that they're on the road to apostasy. Tell them those things, and then tell them again, and again, and again. And the good minister of Jesus Christ, the job is never done. Until the day he dies, he tells them again, and again, and again. And as a good minister of Jesus Christ, he lives with the fact that my job, his job, is not to get results. The job of a good minister of Jesus Christ is to preach the truth, first to know the truth, preach the truth, live the truth. And you, Timmy, you do that, do that, Tim, you'll be a good minister. You'll be a good servant. Because a servant doesn't have to come up with what is right and what is wrong. A servant doesn't have to come up with what is true and what is false. A servant doesn't have to come up with the plan or the way or the program for implementation. The servant simply does what the master tells him to do. And your master has already said marriage is good and meat is good. Your master has already said through the Spirit expressly that some will depart. And so what you need to do is tell them. And so apostasy's cure begins in the pulpits in the churches. From pastors telling them, this is what God says. And that is why every time I enter this pulpit, I'm afraid. I fear. The reason for that is because I know I'm trying to tell you what God says. And the Old Testament word for it is woe means judgment, trouble. Woe upon a man who opens up God's word and says, this is what God says, but it's not what God says. This is why you must pray for your pastors. That when they open God's word, they will be saying what God says. Thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things. Be a good minister of Jesus Christ. But then he goes on to say, nourished up in the words of faith. Still singular, still talking about Timothy. You, Timothy, you'll be nourished up. The word there is disciplined or trained. If you keep doing this, and this is a tremendous principle, it's the, the idea that the more you show others what God's word says, the more you will be trained in what God says. You'll continually be nourished up in the words of faith. You see, Timothy was timid. Timothy was facing a very difficult situation. And it is very obvious from this text as well as others we have read that Timothy is ready to bolt. Timothy, just tell them again. And you'll be nourished up in the words of faith. Just tell them again. And Timothy, it's not that you need the nourishment because you don't know the words of faith. You'll be continually nourished and trained up. You'll grow. You'll, you'll grow by your telling them. But you've already attained it. Not that you're perfect, Timothy, but rather that you know these things. Tell them what you know. And you'll know more. You'll grow more. 
Now he goes on more in chapter 4 to address Timothy. The rest of this chapter is really addressing Timothy and what he's to do because of the coming apostasy. So we notice that this apostasy, departing from the truth, is real. There are many professors and those who try desperately to be a Christian. But without being regenerated, they're simply going along with the ride. These are the targets of the hypocritical liars with burnt consciences. So I'm going to get unpopular for a minute. There's no doubt in my mind, based upon historical realities of the Scripture, both in the Old and New Testament examples, that not all who call themselves the children of God are indeed the children of God. Not all who claim Christ as their Lord and Master are truly are, have Christ as their Lord and Master. In fact, there are some hearing the sermon today with Bibles open and smiles on their faces that will hear, depart from me, I never knew you, workers of iniquity. I don't say that because I'm running through a list of names in my head. Rather, I say that because that's the way it's always been where God has revealed His truth. In Israel, it was so bad at one point in Israel, we know of two believers in an entire nation. There were 12 followers of Jesus, and one of them was a devil. Right away in the early church, there were people growing like Barnabas and giving, and then Ananias and Sapphira reveal a heart of unbelief. And then a man named Simon shows up on the scene who was so excited about the things of God and he was one of the most zealous converts that Peter had. And then he gets, starts to think, man, I could make some money off of this Christian thing. Off this Holy Spirit thing. And Peter responds to him and says, you are yet in the gall of bitterness. It's not what he's saying to a believer. And then you have Demas who forsook Paul. having loved this present world. And so I say, again, there will be some here today that will hear, depart from me, I never knew you from God. Not because I know who you are, but because God does. And this is the way it's always been. These individuals do everything they can to be a Christian. Attend services most of the time, get baptized, give money and time to the church and to God. They are going about, though, to establish their own righteousness. They've never humbly realized that they are a curse and a blight upon the name of Christ. And instead of falling upon the mercies of God and crying out undone, unclean, in your sin and misery, you've attempted to do better, be stronger, be a better person, or impress other Christians with Bible knowledge and external duties, my friend, if this is you, hell is just as hot for the Christian pretender as it is for the pagan who knows nothing of Christ and loves his sin. Maybe even hotter, as Hebrews might indicate. You think you're okay, you're good because you said the sinner's prayer, because you gave your life to God in order to fix your marriage, to make you a better person, to get a job, or to have some kind of status, to get friends. But my friend, I say this with sincere concern for your soul. God is not impressed with you. In fact, He wishes to spew you out of His mouth. If you do not repent of your self-righteousness and fall on the grace of God, Seeking to glorify Him alone, your religious expressions and rituals, your love for preeminence or your false piety, demeaning God's goodness with your religiosity will send you to the lake of fire. With a heart of fear and sorrow, I implore you to flee the wrath to come and to cast yourself only on the mercies and the grace of an almighty God. 
Look not to a prayer to save you. Look not to tears to deliver you. Trust not in sincerity nor in the work of your own doing, but trust only in the finished work of Jesus Christ on your behalf and repent and believe this gospel. I believe there are some here today who are experiencing the conviction of the Holy Spirit in this regard, but I also praise God because I believe that most here in this assembly desire holy, godly lives of thankfulness. And I call you my brothers and sisters. Yes, examine yourself and see if you be in the faith. And as the Spirit of God confirms this within your heart, rejoice and give God thanks. Know God, love God, serve God through His Word and prayer, and the Spirit will keep you from falling. Yet we noticed that Timothy's responsibility as shepherd was to put the brethren in remembrance. And so we might say, well, that's great, Pastor. We'll pray for you to do that. And yes, I am deeply convicted with this responsibility, but the rest of it might be this way. But what about us? What about those who are not shepherds like Timothy was? I think if we turn over to Hebrews chapter 3, 12 and 13, we can get some words of admonition and practice for us. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 3. And we'll close with this. Verse 12. Take heed, brethren. Same language used by Paul and Timothy. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Now, I said this before, I'll explain it again. Uh, that word, you, there is plural. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in among you all an evil heart, singular, of unbelief. So it's not saying that, take heed, brothers, lest you have some evil in your heart. Rather, it's saying, take heed, brethren, lest amongst your assembly there be one or two, or there be an evil heart of unbelief in departing, or that causes them to depart. That's the same word, apostatize, same word in 1 Timothy 4, in departing from the living God. There's the warning, the warning that was already given that Paul gives in Timothy and the Apostle here gives again, take heed that there's among you those that may have an evil heart of unbelief. They are threatening to apostatize and they may not even know it and you may not know it. But watch out, it's going to happen. Be careful. And so we go back to 1 Timothy and we say, well, what happens? Timothy, remind them, warn them, remind them. Okay, what about me? Verse 13 of Hebrews 3. But, and this is plural, you exhort one another daily. He's not talking then about pastors here. He's talking about the same plural you before, the assembly. But you exhort one another daily. While it is called today, or that's an idiom meaning urgently, urgently, lest any of you, plural, be hardened through the deceitfulness of, the, of sin. And in the context here, the deceitfulness of this kind of sin, the sin that causes them to not believe, unbelief, to depart. What can you do? How can you glorify God? How can you... You're not a pastor. What are you supposed to do? The responsibility is both. Shepherds must stick to the Word of God and bathe the Word of God in preaching, bathe the, bathe the preaching and teaching of the Word of God in prayer, reminding God's people of these things continually. A pattern for good, good pastoral ministry, as I already said before, is simple. Know good the truth, preach the truth, live the truth. But the sheep, the people of God, must be encouraging one another the word exhort there in Hebrews 3.13 is the same word used over, a favorite word of the Apostle Paul, parakletos. It means to come alongside. And although the word exhort may have the sound of harshness or roughness, the word parakletos most often is translated the word encourage. So it's not the idea of just going around to people saying, you know what, I don't think you're saved, get saved. And you, I don't think you are, and I don't think you're a Christian, I don't think you are, and I'm exhorting. 
The word come alongside is there. That means I come alongside a brother. I come alongside a sister. Especially one who maybe has been absent from the assembly. Maybe one who is struggling with sin. Maybe one who is living a lifestyle that does not reflect and is scandalous against the Word of God. And we are responsible not to say, well, pastor will get them from the pulpit. We are responsible to come alongside them and encourage them. Believe. Don't depart from the living God. So often this doesn't happen in the church because everyone is waiting for someone to come along beside them. Instead of going alongside someone. You see, this can only be done as we live simple lives of urgent gospel transparency. It's not about having friends in this assembly. You can go a lot of places and have friends, but friends don't keep you out of hell. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the church, we must exhort one another daily. We must be noticing when professing brothers or sisters are absent from assembly, and we must lovingly and graciously say, Why? We must be lovingly encouraging one another. What are you reading in God's Word? What is God teaching you? What, is your, what are you praying for? How can I pray for you? Without judging one another unjustly, Providing this kind of accountability, praying for one another, loving one another, and preaching the gospel of grace to one another. Yes, it begins in the pulpit, but the work of the ministry is done in the pew. This is the cure for apostasy. This is what he says. Timothy, remind them. Here in Hebrews, exhort, encourage. And I'm impacted by this. Protection from apostasy is a Christian community endeavor. Think about that and apply that. Let us be careful, brothers and sisters, that in all that we have experienced and all the blessings of God in this land in which we live, that although we may even be truly Christian, we do not imbibe the apostate spirit of the culture and be ungrateful people. May we bloom where we are planted because God has sovereignly planted us where He desires. Glorify God. Give Him thanks for His mercy endures forever.